Hello! This will be my last video looking back at Space Cases, covering the last three episodes. Um, before I get to that, uh, I read, um, I did a little more uh, exploring of the SpaceCasesTV.com website, and I would encourage uh, anyone watching this who's curious about Space Cases, and why else would you be uh, watching this, uh, to go and explore that website. Um, for one thing, there is uh, a link to uh, a script for an episode that was never filmed. I haven't read it yet because it was never filmed and so it is not part of looking back. It would be part of uh, looking forward or, or whatever for me personally. Um, and it, But it, it's, a, it's a good accompaniment to any, um, a good companion piece to any anyone uh, watching uh, Space Cases uh, episodes through as I've been doing. Also, um, a blog post from Peter David it's from 2012 but is actually something he wrote in 1997 about the cancellation of Space Cases and um, why he thinks it happened uh, are based on, you know, his experience, um, and also some things that might have prevented its cancellation, might have made it uh, more marketable and more successful than it was, um, uh, including some very interesting uh, cameos that they had wanted to do, but... Uh, Nickelodeon had said no. Uh, and even with my limited knowledge of two of the three major uh, cameos that might have appeared in episodes, uh, I still think that they actually would have been great. Um, so I'll link to that. I'll try to remember to. Um, when I post this video, I'll link to it along with my uh, Space Cases thing from Medium in which I pitch uh, how I would do a Space Cases reboot movie. Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, yeah, so as soon as uh, you finish watching the, the YouTube thing about looking back at the uh, Space Cases up until it was cancelled, read about that cancellation and, uh, and what, and what might have been. Uh, so I'll go first, uh, I'll go now to the uh, episodes, and the first is Runaway. Now this is uh, an episode that is, uh, kind of uh, in the same league as uh, Ma, but for different reasons. Uh, was it Ma? Mother Knows Best. Um, in that, it's not like Ma in that I remember it exists and I don't really like it or relish watching it. Um, I always forget that it exists. It's kind of like, and, I, and same thing with the uh, very last episode, uh, Friend in Need, I think it's called. I always forget about them. I remember that one now better than I remember this one. It's possible I didn't see them when I was younger, uh, toward the end of Space Cases uh, that year. Peter David writes that the series finale of Space Cases was on Nickelodeon opposite the Super Bowl, so that might be why I don't remember that one. And uh, Runaway is just, it's kind of, it's better than Ma, I think, but it's also, it's its not that memorable. I think maybe there's too much going on. Um, its It's inspired by the Apollo 13 moon mission, which was, uh, it was the, it was supposed to be the third, uh, space launch to land on the moon, but something went wrong with their oxygen, and they ended up just circling the moon and coming back to Earth, which is still really cool and cooler than anything I've ever done, but not landing on the moon, and, uh, and not doing so for, uh, scientific mechanical, uh, problem reasons. And that is what this one is about. This one is about uh, Bova and Radu are out in uh, the Krista's, one of the Krista's little scouting ships called Starling 9. Um, perhaps it is called Starling. Perhaps that is the proof that the Krista is supposed to look like a bird. And that the Starling, which looks like, it looks kind of like the Krista's head. Um, if the Krista were a bird, it would be its head. I guess it's the, the cockpit or the front of the Krista. Um, so I think that that is arguments in favor of the Chris is supposed to look like a bird, not a fish or a dragon. Um, but uh, Radu and Bova are out there, they're doing something, it doesn't really matter what, and then they're on their way back from their scientific expedition, and meanwhile Susie has been fiddling with the, uh, the Krista's engines, and she's been able to make it go really fast, at least she says. And so Harlan uh, then uses this as an opportunity to say, well, I want to, I want to fly the really fast Krista, so I'm going to kick it into high gear now while we wait for them to come back. And uh, the the lesson of the episode is they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have tried.
tried to show off, especially at a time when their friends were in danger. And the, uh, the third thing that's happening, um, third being after Starling 1, Susie and Harlan 2, um, and then this is the third, is that uh, Rosie and Miss Davenport get stuck in the jump tubes while the Krista is careening out of control. And uh, one of the things it does as it careens out of control is it clips the Starling, sending the Starling careening out of control, spinning out into space. It's actually, it's, I always forget about it, but it is the sort of uh, intense, unsettling episode that I wanted Mother Knows Best to be. Um, because it's the most danger, I would say, that any of these kids have been in. And it's the most guilt and the most uh, angst uh, about having done something that, with serious consequences that Harlan feels, that Susie feels, uh, that any of them feel. So um, it's, a, it's a good one. It's just that I always forget it because I might not have seen it and it might not have been ingrained in my memory. Uh, so now I'll get to notes on it, uh, in case there's anything that I um, didn't say uh, that I wrote down. Um, oh, Harlan also feels guilty because he was supposed to go out in the Starling, but uh, he uh, let Radu have the opportunity. Um, so that's another element of his guilt. Um, let's see. Yeah, I wrote down that the Davenport Rosie Jump to Bride is, um, pretty goofy, but it all is probably intended to be, I don't know what else those two would have done, and Goddard is still in the uh, health pod. I don't know what else those two would have done in the episode, other than get in the way, so it might have been just giving them something to do, but also just without that, it's just the dark, intense, uh, will they, won't they survive episode that you can pretty much guess that they will survive because it's a Nickelodeon show for kids. But it's still, it's, like I said, of all the episodes, it's the most peril that they're ever in. It's most, it's the most, what are they going to do? Because they keep trying things and those things keep not working. Um, so that was probably to leaven it a little. Um, let's see. And, um, and I wrote, well, the last thing I wrote down, um, Thelma is extremely fast. And we kind of get a sense of this in how she jokingly always happens to be right there whenever someone says Thelma. But I wrote down, maybe there's more than one Thelma. Uh, like the Gizbot, we find out there's more than one Gizbot, maybe there's more than one Thelma. But probably not. That's probably just a ridiculous speculation. Anyway, so that's that episode. Um, which is, again, an interesting one that I never remember. Uh, the next one I do remember very clearly, and it is one of my favorites, uh, The Trouble with Doubles, um, which is um, perhaps, unlike like Runaway, I think that's based on a song, like most of the titles are based on songs. The Trouble with Doubles sounds like The Trouble with Tribbles, which is a very famous Star Trek episode. Um, I don't know if that's what they're going for, but it would make sense. Um, anyway, so in this one, it's got that, my favorite of all science fiction tropes, the evil twin, uh, or in any way, evil version of the characters we know and love. In this case, everyone except for Goddard and Thelma is turned, not turned, but um, a, uh, a kind of green-blue sludge smoke uh, infests the Krista and um, hangs around in the jump tubes um, which, apparently, the Krista, this means, is not airtight, I would think. But, again, science fiction, kids show, not going to harp on it, but it does mean that the ship has a leak. Um, hangs out in the jump tubes, and then whenever they go through the jump tubes, the characters, uh, this thing redirects the original person to the lounge, which it has taken over the Krista and locked, uh, uh, and then sends an evil twin to the command post where the ship is driven. Um, uh, the uh, Space Cases TV website, I think, uh, said, just pointed out what is the end game of this sludge in creating the evil twins and taking over the Krista, and it's not never really clear, and I would argue it doesn't have to be. Um, this is a just a malevolent force that 
uh, like any body snatcher perhaps just wants to repopulate and repopulate and repopulate, like this, like a zombie virus. Um, so it, I, I don't count that against it. Um, everyone gets an evil twin except for Goddard and Thelma, who I don't think Thelma ever travels by the jump tubes. I, I might be wrong on that, but I don't have any memory of her going through the jump tubes. Um, and again, it might be because she's really fast or there's one of her in every room. Um, let's see. The doppelganger is the name of the uh, thing. And the, the episode opens with Harlan teaching Bova how to drive. And this is based on um, Miss Davenport has given evaluations to all of them, including Susie, who Susie, she says to Rosie, I'm not even a student. Why did I get one of these? But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, she should have been Catalina, but uh, it's the setup for the episode. They have to get to know themselves better, which is the point of all episodes. They, they learn things about themselves and they grow, but in this one they specific, have specific things they have to look at about themselves, and that ultimately helps them to combat their doppelgangers. Um, but Harlan, uh, you know, one of his things is essentially he doesn't trust anyone else to drive the ship. And since Catalina left, no one else has really been trying to drive the ship, but he decides to try to teach Bova uh, at the beginning, and Bova nearly runs into a satellite, and the satellite is where the doppelganger is, and so the episode begins. Um, let's see. Oh, and they mention uh, fuel... Thelma mentions fuel troubles, which, to the show's credit, was mentioned in the previous episode when they were in overdrive, and she was saying, we're going to run out of fuel. So that sets it up uh, very nicely. It's not just a suddenly we're having fuel troubles, even though we've been traveling for almost two seasons, and, uh, and, and, and audiences are assuming we have an infinite amount of fuel. Um, of course, at the end of the episode, they turn the doppelganger into fuel, uh, which presumably would have seen them through the, the uh, other three seasons. Uh, maybe not. Um, but I liked that touch that the fuel thing was set up in one episode and then it was here. It might have been a complete accident, but it works really well. Um, my favorite trope, evil versions of other characters. Um, oh, we get a shot of we get a lot of toward the end of the season, maybe just bigger budget or better technology, but we get a lot of great... I mean, it still it looks like video games of the time, but to me, that's what I liked. Uh, and, and I still consider it fun to look at. Great shots of the ship narrowly missing the, uh, the satellite uh, at the end approaching the planet. Uh, Razul, or the, uh, the mission that they need to accomplish is they need to get to this planet where they use a hyper jump and they need to impress the Razulian, uh, Razulian uh, minister or something uh, uh, who, who doesn't, who's very proper and doesn't like any messiness and so Goddard, who is back now, uh, knows this about him and is trying to keep the ship in good standing. Um, and that is the mission that they need to accomplish, and that's what the evil twins are in the way of. Uh, and the Rosulian is played by, apparently, Gilderoy Lockhart from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, the movie. Um, it's really Marcel Janin, who has played many characters in the uh, thing, but he reminded me a lot of Gilderoy Lockhart. Um, also, just of note, as far as uh, credit where it's due, a lot of fighting a lot of stunts in this episode. Walter Jones himself was the stunt coordinator. Um, so cool for him. Um, but one of the shots that we get um, is uh, of the uh, the interior of the crystal, I guess, and the jump tubes all going which way. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see that there are t actual physical tubes that go all over the crystal, but as far as how they get uh, the... Uh, kids and the adults from one part of the crystal to the next, it, they kind of, they don't work more like solid tubes. They work more like the uh, stairs at Hogwarts that change every so often and, uh, and therefore can lead to different places at different times. But it's still cool seeing more of the crystal, seeing the crystal approach the planet somewhat recklessly. Um, let's see. Um, they, so there, I'll talk a bit about the evil twins. Um, Bova has the best villain voice, um, and he just, they all kind of, most of them kind of just talk like they say evil things, but in the regular voices, but he just goes into kind of a cackle, like everything that he says is being spoken through a cackle, and he's very mustache twirly out of all of them. He seemed to have a really great time doing this. Um, they all did, but him in particular, 
Um, Miss Davenport's clone at one point has one of my favorite lines. Um, she, the Davenport and Rosie are paired up again uh, for the purposes of this episode, and the evil Davenport says to the evil Rosie, hold me back, little pink person, and it's just uh, such a ridiculous line. Um, another funny line, while I'm on funny lines, is uh, belongs to Thelma. I mentioned that the lounge where, that, where all the uh, original people are uh, imprisoned is locked, and they try everything to open it, Radu with his super strength, uh, trying all sorts of things with wires, I think, and then uh, Thelma arrives and Goddard says, I can't get the door open. Thelma just turns to the door and says, open, please and it opens. So it's it's like, open please is not a funny thing to say, but in the, in the situation, the ridiculousness uh, where the episode needed to go at that point, it's, it's very funny. Um, oftentimes I will say something is funny and I will quote it, and it might not appear funny, but that's why I say watch the episode and then it'll be funny. Of course, if you watch the episode after I've already ruined it for you, it might not be funny, but uh, it's a chance you should be willing to take. Uh, let's see. The the uh, oh Harlan and and Radu do the classic. Um, first, their evil twins try to get try to get them to fight each other, and then they uh, get in on it, or they seem to, and then they get the evil twins to fight each other, and then they kind of retreat, and they have a nice bonding moment. Um, so that's further further de developments in their relationship. And then I wrote, how did Susie get away? Um, she needed to be somewhere uh, for the, um, the uh, conclusion of the episode. She's doing the psychic battle thing where she and her doppelganger, uh, their, their psychic spirits come out and start twirling in combat. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, and South Park said it better, uh, psychics doing battle is not interesting to watch. So wisely, she just extracts herself from that, gets back to the command post, and um, the episode goes on. But they all confront their doppelgangers, and um, but ultimately uh, she has she comes up with the idea, which is why she needs to be there, of sucking the doppelganger mist into the ship to use as fuel. Um, I wrote down the evil twins, the way that they dissolve when they are defeated, reminds me of, there's a video game, I only played it once at a Taekwondo overnight uh, uh, thing um, where, at the place where I took Taekwondo and I think I played it in the morning is a battle game where the characters are made of multi of brightly colored balls different shapes and I was somewhat good at it and then when the uh, whenever one of the, the characters was defeated it would dissolve into a bunch of balls bouncing all over the place and the way that the uh, space cases dissolved reminded me of that which goes again to the the special effects look like video games they so uh, special effects look like video games today because the same technology is used. So it's not a diss. It's just uh, it looked really cool, and that's how it reminded the dissol the dissolution didn't look as cool as like the ship approaching the planet, but I liked it. Um, and this is the first time, the first t the first time I was when I was younger, much younger, and I saw these sh episodes for the first time, and they said the line, um, "The ship is alive." That was the first time that I thought that I, that it had occurred to me that the Krista was alive, that it had a, that it was part animal or whatever, and but you know as I've watched it since, um, there are hints in earlier episodes, things like uh, Thelma saying the the ship has a, um, a good uh, sense of character, uh, Rosie saying that the ship has healing powers, so it's not it's. It's, but at the time it was uh, like I hadn't picked up on, I didn't pick up on things very well back then. And uh, so at the time it was, this was the revelation that the Krista is not just a machine, that it is also in some way living. Um, so that was cool. And then the episode ends um, amusingly on the uh, question of whether or not Goddard is one of the evil twins that he describes having escaped. And the final episode is a friend in need. The friend in need is named Pezu and is voiced by Peter David's daughter, Shana, or Shana, um, S-H-A-N-A. And um, in the uh, blog post, he uh, mentions what, what a fan of the show his daughters were. The other, one of his other daughters was in King of the Hill. Um, she is briefly visible. And the third daughter was too young, I guess, to be in an episode. 
but uh, apparently she really loved it, um, just like I do. I love space cases. So uh, the first thing I wrote down was that this is another season finale, and it is another episode where they, uh, the, the, they dock with a seemingly abandoned uh, space station or craft that was recently attacked by the Spung. And so at the beginning, it's kind of like, oh, they're doing it again. But obviously it's not the Krista. It's not as good an episode as that episode. That episode is great. And this episode is merely good. Um, uh, both of them have George Takei as Warlord Shank. And I'll just go straight to... No, I won't go straight to it because I kind of need a little background. Um, Susie mentions when they're aboard the space station that the giant checkerboard-like room with all the gadgets and things looks kind of like her bedroom back home, but cozier, which is a very uh, quirky thing to say and, and says something about her character and her species. And it's, uh, and it's so it's a funny detail. It tells us a little bit about her without telling us that much about her. Um, Davenport, Bova, and Rosie once again stay back, stay behind. I wrote, but for how long? I think they stay on the ship the entire episode this time. Um, Pezu is a child, more of a child than... And she's a computer program, but she's a child more than the kids from the Krista are. She's needy, and she's lonely, and I don't know if the space station was once populated with more people like her, or if it was populated by um, physical people that walk around, or robots, but the Spung uh, took away all of her friends, and so she wants Susie, who uh, finds the place familiar... Uh, and is perhaps uh, the smartest of the crew, uh, and therefore the best friend for a computer program. Um, Pezu wants Susie to stay and be her friend, um, and gets rid of uh, Radu, Harlan, and Goddard by banishing them to, I guess, not even like a little prison, but uh, elsewhere in the space station in a kind of a maze that they have to run through, and then there's a projection of Warlord Shank for some reason. Um, and, um, let's see. Meanwhile, she, uh, Pezu downloads a virus into the Krista to keep it from escaping, and also into Thelma, who tries to fight the virus. She has virus fighting software, but it doesn't work, and we get more evil Thelma, which is great. Evil Thelma is great because of Thelma's smile, and, um, because the character being a robot, you, and not, and not, not human, uh, you can, but human emulating, notably, um, you can tell she's she's never quite right and therefore always a bit uh, off and unsettling, but when she goes evil, it's so, so when she goes evil, it's extra uh, entertaining. Um, Warlord Shank, uh, since he's a projection and not the actual Warlord Shank, uh, does not recognize them, and Goddard is the one who points this out, and I point out this is, the, this is the second time that Warlord Shank has not recognized Goddard when he should have, because they do actually meet in Spung at heart uh, before On the Road to Find Out, uh, and so he, Warlord Shank should have recognized him in that, but nitpicking. Um, in a very Indiana Jones moment, uh, a kind of spike cage thing falls down on our three heroes in the, uh, in the maze, and Radu catches it, which is cool. A uh, nice heroic moment for him. Um, the episode I wrote down reminds me of the, uh, if you watched Pokemon, and if you watched Space Cases, you probably watched Pokemon, um, the, uh, episode, or the trio of episodes featuring the psychic Pokemon gym leader Sabrina, and how when, uh, Ash loses the battle, he and Misty and Brock are turned into, first, in the first case, they're, they're just shrunk, and then put into a little dollhouse, doll neighborhood uh, play area for uh, Sabrina's younger uh, projected self. And then the second time he loses, Brock and Misty are turned into dolls. And this kind of reminded me that, the way that Pezu handles Harlan, Radu, and, and Goddard. Um, I wrote down Thelma is like a classic movie monster, and this again goes to how fast she is. She's really, really fast unless you're watching her on the screen, and then she's kind of lurching and she doesn't exactly run, she can't run because she's a stiff robot, but whenever you're not watching her move, she's moving really fast, like uh, like a, what's his name in Halloween, uh, Mike Myers. So that was, 
that was a fun thing. I just watched a lot of monster movies, as you might uh, be able to guess from looking through my YouTube videos. Um, there's a new spun ship. Uh, it's not a kill cruiser. I don't know what it is, but it looks like Visser Three's blade ship from Animorphs, but green. Uh, it looks really cool. And now I'll get to. So we actually have Warlord Shank, not just the projection of Warlord Shank, but um, he and the Spung had come and done damage to Pezu's space station, but she had also done damage to them, disabling all of their weapons. And so when they realize as they turn around, they come back, they want to undo that and, um, and get their weapons back. Uh, and then as they approach, they see the Krista's there, and Warlord Shank's uh, underling says, uh, Should we destroy the ship, sir? And uh, I'm not going to imitate George Decay, and I couldn't make it. Again, this is going to be one of the things. It's really funny if you watch him do it. I'm going to say it so that you know what it is. Um, a guy says, should we destroy their ship? And Shank goes, how? By throwing rocks at it? Uh, that was a little bit the way that he does it. But if you know George Decay, you know he's known for his deep voice. And as Warlord Shank, he, he very sinister uh, and evil, deep voice. And in that line... Um, his indignation just he, he he lets his voice screech and it's just it's hilarious for that reason it's a hilarious line like this big intimidating spung ship is going to throw rocks to destroy the krista uh, and yeah you have to you have to be there you have to watch it i wrote down a couple more things we find out that i don't i think this is the first mention of the united populated planets um which is presumably what the Star Dogs are, what the Star Academy is about, United Populated Planets, but I think this is the first time those words have been uttered. I might be wrong. Comment if I am. Um, we find out before Thelma goes uh, back to normal that she has she can fire lasers from her hand. So that's another... We always find out uh, fun things about Thelma. And um, then Rosie, in, a, in another very dark moment, uh, is when Bova's shocking... Uh, Thelma doesn't work. Rosie is ready to melt Thelma, and that would actually work because that is a uh, not a technical thing, but a, a physical thing. Uh, and Rosie doesn't want to do it, but Thelma keeps coming, and then just in time, um, Thelma goes back to normal. Um, and in her in celebration, Davenport hugs Rosie, and Rosie is still really, really uh, burning from having almost melted Thelma, and so that's a funny moment. Um, a lot of the funny moments come after the intense moments. Um, for obvious reasons. And, uh, and the uh, episode ends on a um, very slapstick kind of the uh, Spung are being chased around by Pezu through the maze, and a uh, door closes as they're running, and they run into it and imprint on it like a, like a cartoon. Um, I bet that was uh, the executives at Nickelodeon's idea. Um, but maybe it wasn't. So that's that and then there's one more thing uh well a couple more things so the next watch through that i'll do this sort of thing for i'm going to do uh, uh wishbone because at the first time i watched wishbone as a child i had not read any of the books that wishbone uh and uh, did episodes about and now i have read all of them not all of them i haven't read all of them um but a lot of them and so i'm looking forward to doing that um i've made a habit of re-watching them as i've read books that they are based on um, but I'm going to do all of them uh, this time through. And I'm also, over the first 24 or 25 days of December, I'm going to post uh, reading... I'm going to read all of uh, A Christmas Carol in small chunks. Uh, so those are the next things that I will do. I'm recording this on Wednesday. I'm going to put it on YouTube on Friday. Uh, but on Monday, when I'm not going to have any videos, uh, and let me just... Uh, Google something to make sure that what I'm about to say is absolutely true, but I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, on Monday, November 30th, uh, Walter Jones, Walter Emanuel Jones, Harlan Band himself, uh, will turn 50. And so um, maybe I'll watch an episode of Power Rangers or something uh, it, to observe his birthday, but that's, uh, I don't know what to say. Congratulations, or on making it to 50. A lot of people make it to 50. Uh, but, you know, happy birthday to Walter Jones. I raise a glass to Walter Jones and his wonderful uh, Star Trek for Kids called Space Cases. Um, 
I hope you've enjoyed this uh, series of videos, and I hope that you will, if you haven't already, one day enjoy Space Cases itself.